Good morning, everyone. Nothing's on. Never mind. Well, we're still getting the mics going. I just wanted to talk to everybody about Vacation Bible School. I see a lot of families out there. Vacation Bible School, real quick. I see a lot of families out there. Please take advantage of the blue um, brochures that are pinned to the bulletin board in the gathering space and sign up. That way, if you have friends you want to hang with, we'll make sure you get there with them. Also, if you have any friends from First Presbyterian or from Prospect Street United Methodist that you want to hang with, they are joining us this year. So we're going to have a really full house and a really great time. I'm also still looking for volunteers, especially from our middle schoolers and our high schoolers. So please see me after the service. That was a father out there. There we go. And to those of you that may not be a father but have played that role for someone in your lives. Um, you may have seen on the screen already, we collected over $1,000 last week for Food for the Poor. So that's pretty exciting. Um, gentle Worship is next week at 1.30, and Ladies Night Out is next Monday. Other than that, there's other announcements and more details in the bulletin. You can read that yourself. Would you please stand for the call to worship? Happy are they whose transgressions are forgiven and whose sin is put away. Happy are they to whom the Lord imputes no guilt and in whose spirit there is no guile. While I, While I held my tongue, my, tongue, my bones, bones withered away because, because of my groaning all day long. For your hand was heavy upon me day and night. My moisture was dried up as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not conceal my guilt. I said, I will, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. Then you forgave me the guilt of my sin. Therefore, all the faithful will make their prayers to you in time of trouble. When the great waters overflow, they shall not reach them. You are my hiding place. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. I will guide you with my eye. Do not be like horse or mule, which have no understanding, who must be fitted with bit and bridle, or else they will not stay near you. Great are the tribulations of the wicked, but mercy embraces those who trust in the Lord. Be glad, you righteous, and rejoice in the Lord. Shout for joy, all who are true of heart. One, two, ready, and...
Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, abounding in steadfast love toward us, healing the sick and raising the dead, showering us with every good gift. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Just and gracious God, we, we come, come to you for healing and life. Our, Our sins, sins hurt others and diminish us. We, we confess them to you. Our, Our lives bear the scars of sin. We bring, bring these also to you. Show, show us your mercy, O God. Bind up our wounds, forgive us our sins, and free us to love for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The Apostle Paul assures us, when we were dead in our trespasses, God made us alive together with Christ, nailing the record of our sins to the cross. Jesus says to you, your sins are forgiven. Be at peace and tell everyone how much God has done for you. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. O oh God, throughout the ages you judge your people with mercy, and you inspire us to speak your truth. By your Spirit, anoint us for lives of faith and service, and bring all people into your forgiveness. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. 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 Would you please be seated? The first reading is from 2 Samuel 11, 26, 23, 10, and 13, 15. When the wife of Uriah heard that her husband was dead, she made lamentation for him. When the morning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord, and the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said to him, There were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor had nothing but one little ewe lamb which he had bought. He brought it up, and it grew up with him and with his children. It used to eat of his meager fare and drink from his cup and lie at his bosom, and it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was loath to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the warfare who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it that for the guest who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against that man. He said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who had done this deserves to die. He shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing, and because he had no pity. Nathan said to David, You are that man, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel. I, your master's house, and your master's wives into the bosom, and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have added as much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord? to do what the evil in his sight. You have struck down Uriah the high tight with a sword and have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the Amorites. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house 
for you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan said to David, now that the Lord has put away your sins, you shall not die. Nevertheless, because by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord, the child that is born of you shall die. Then Nathan went to his house. The Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bore to David, and it became very ill. Lord, you have my heart, and I will search for yours. Jesus, take my life and lead me on. Lord, you have my heart, and I will search for yours. Let me be to you a second reading comes from the book of Galatians, chapter 2, verses 15 through 21. We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is justified not by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. And we have come to believe in Christ Jesus so that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by doing the works of the law, because no one will be justified by the works of the law. But if... In our effort to be justified by Christ, we ourselves have been found to be sinners. Is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. But if I build up again the very things that I once tore down, then I demonstrate that I am a transgressor. For through the law I died to the law, so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if justification comes through the law, then Christ died for nothing.
seventh chapter. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and took his place at the table. And a woman in the city who was a sinner, having learned that he was eating at the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster jar of ointment. She stood behind him at his feet, weeping, and began to bathe his feet with her tears and to dry them with her hair. Then she continued kissing his feet and anointing them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw it, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what kind of woman this is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. Jesus spoke up and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. Teacher, he replied, speak. A certain creditor had two debtors, one owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debts of both of them. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, I suppose, the one for whom he canceled the greater debt. And Jesus said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has bathed my feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which were many, have been forgiven. Hence, she has shown great love. But the one to whom little is forgiven loves little. Then he said to her, Your sins are forgiven. But those who were at his table with him began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Soon afterwards, he went on through cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him as well as some women who had been cured of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joetta, pardon me, the wife of Herod's steward, Chutza, and Susanna, and many others, who provided for them out of their resources. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Why don't you be seated? Let us pray. Great God, for your involvement in our lives and the lives of our neighbor, we thank you. For the reality that we can live each day in communion with you and in prayer with you, we thank you. And so on this day, we ask that you speak to our lives through this story, through this experience, and may we be better people for having been with you. In the name of Christ, amen. No one wants to admit neediness. No one wants to admit guilt or woundedness or sin, for that matter. No one wants to appear weak or show off the spackle and duct tape that is patching our cracks and holding us together. No one wants to acknowledge the linen tomb wrappings that are trailing behind us, even when we're all dressed up and feeling fine. You see, if we admit that we are broken, then we have to admit that we cannot fix ourselves. If we admit that we are guilty, then we must confess that we have done something wrong. If we admit that we are needy, then eventually we have to face the fact that we are really not in control. The woman in the gospel lesson today didn't have that problem. She was so broken so wounded that her pride was destroyed and her defenses were down. This woman of the gospel was so filled with need that there was no longer room for pride or shame or fear. We don't even know her name. 
Some commentators say it was Mary of Bethany and others Mary Magdalene, but Luke simply calls her a sinful woman. Certainly Simon the Pharisee thought she was a sinner. He saw a woman whose unbound hair made a clear statement about who she was and what she did. You see, in the ancient world, unbound hair could be the mark of a prostitute. And perhaps Simon knew exactly why she was in his house and at his dinner. But sometimes, like in Corinth, unbound hair could also be a sign of a woman prophesying. But whether she was a prophet or a prostitute, her actions that night were surprising, even shocking. Normally, when feet were anointed, they weren't anointed for dinner, they were anointed when a person had died. When you washed their feet, that was a sign of hospitality. But this woman, unannounced and uninvited, anointed the feet of Jesus with costly perfume and washed them with her tears. When she was done, she kissed them in an outpouring of gratitude and love. Simon the Pharisee was stunned, stunned at her behavior, and he wondered why Jesus didn't know who he was dealing with. But Jesus did know who he was dealing with. He not only knew about this woman, he knew about Simon the Pharisee, too. While Simon saw a sinner, Jesus saw a woman of potential, a woman who was both repentant and grateful, a woman whose need for forgiveness drove her to her knees and brought her to her senses. While Simon the Pharisee saw a sinner, Jesus saw a woman who understood the value of worship. Now, her worship did not depend on a particular type of music or a certain style of architecture. She didn't need a community performance or a committee of her peers. Her worship didn't involve language or fights over organ consoles. Her worship wasn't fueled by arguments over the placement of a chair or symbols on a banner. She simply worshiped at the feet of Jesus. By the customs of her day, she was absolutely positively disqualified to be even near that house. But unlike the wealthy Pharisee, she understood that the heart of worship lies at the feet of Jesus, and nothing could get in her way. She understood that being present with Jesus calls for an extravagant response. Jesus looked into her heart, and he knew that she was truly repentant. She experienced a deep conversion of heart that is accompanied by, by fruitful pain and, and, and sadness and great joy. She had been transformed. And she knew that the only appropriate response to transformation was to throw herself at the feet of her Lord. This story is about forgiveness. Forgiveness. And for this woman, forgiveness was being given everything. And we are given everything. Forgiveness is the greatest gift that we could ever receive. But is forgiveness really everything? I mean, can it possibly be worth that much? Well, consider this. Forgiveness is at the heart of the restoration of a relationship. It is a releasing of any claim on someone else for past injury or offense. Jesus likens forgiveness to canceling a debt, and that's absolutely a brilliant analogy. Forgiveness cancels relational debt and opens up the future. That's why it's so important, why it's so valuable. But it's more. Forgiveness also gives you back yourself. You see, after a while, if you're indebted, owe others, know yourself first and foremost as a sinner, well, these realities come to dominate and define you. You, know, or you are no more or no less than what you've done, the mistakes you've made, the debt you owe. When you are forgiven, all these limitations disappear and you are restored, renewed, and set free. Yeah, forgiveness is everything. It's everything if, if we know we need it. And that can be a mighty big if.
I say big if because so often we fool ourselves into believing that, we, that our sin is not as big of a deal as other people's sins. We see grievous sins committed each and every day and think to ourselves that, well, we're not all that bad. As if there's some hierarchy of sins listed in some secret part of the Bible saying that one sin is better than another. Hogwash. You find it and you show it to me and then we'll talk. Good luck. You're not going to find it. Sin is sin. Rebellion is rebellion. God does not make a hierarchy of those things. So we have to be cautioned this day, dear Christian. The moment we think that we are better than someone else means that we side with the Simons of the world who sit back and smugly proclaim she is a sinner. The moment we think that way we cheapen the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. We heard it stated in the second lesson as clearly as it possibly could be. If justification is by the law of how good I am or how bad I am, then the sacrifice of Christ was in vain. It's not about that. It's about the love of God. Dare we allow ourselves the terrible suffering endured by, to say that the terrible suffering by Jesus wasn't really necessary because I'm okay? Ooh. You're on the wrong bus heading the wrong direction. Remember that brilliant debt analogy? One debtor owes 50000 and another 5000 Both debts are canceled. Who is more appreciative? Well, this subtle analogy... Jesus teaches three spiritual truths. First of all, he's showing us spiritually that we all have a debt to pay. Secondly, it doesn't matter how big the debt is, you think it is, or how small you think it is, you can't pay it. And three, there's a direct relation between what we think we have been forgiven of and how much we love the one who has forgiven us. Direct correlation. A lazy, inactive, and poorly committed Christian is one who places little value on what it costs God to remove his or her sins. What God has done just isn't worth that much to them. I think that's why we in this day and age struggle with commitment to God. We don't think much of what Jesus did. Oh. I read an illustration from Mark Allen Powell. Now, Kevin quotes this guy all the time. He, he goes to Bible study, he quotes Mark Allen Powell. He preaches a sermon, he quotes Mark Allen Powell. I figure, well, why should he have all the fun? I'm going to quote Mark Allen Powell. So he wrote this thing. He wrote, basically, I thought the good news revealed in and through Jesus Christ was that God accepts us just the way we are. A lot of Lutherans think that. Then I encountered liberation theology. I remember a seminar I attended in college. A large African-American man had two big signs up at the front of the classroom. One read, Jesus Christ accepts you the way you are. The other said, Jesus Christ will change your life. Now, both are biblical and both are good news, the speaker affirmed. So why is it that you Lutherans equate the gospel with one sign and not the other? You say, Jesus will change my life? Well, that's nice. But the really, really good news is that Jesus accepts me the way I am. You get so excited that Jesus will accept you as you are that after a while, some of us begin to wonder whether this isn't because you plan on staying the way you are, whether Jesus will change you or not. Now, where I come from, in the inner city, I know some folks who, if you tell them Jesus accepts you the way you are, will respond, oh, that's really nice of him, but the fact is I don't really like being the way I am. My life isn't so good. It's nice that Jesus loves me, even though I'm poor and hungry and my life is a mess. But you know what would really be some good news? Really good news would be if he'd change my life so that I don't have to be this way. Hmm. This God-sent gift of forgiveness involves a radical reorientation of our whole life and a conversion to God with our whole heart. It requires that we put away our pride and set aside our fear. It means that we open our eyes to those linen tomb wrappings that are coming from us even when we're dressed up and feeling fine. It means we don't have to be this way. We never knew her name. This woman with the unbound hair who 
made such a, a scene at Simon's house. But whether she was a prophet or a prostitute, she is our model and our guide. Her actions show us what our response should be to the incredible gift that we have been given. So what kind of extravagant response will we make as we worship at the feet of our Lord? Amen. Let us pray. O oh, wise, gracious, and living God, we thank you for the love that you have given us in Jesus Christ, love that looks beyond our sin. O oh, God, give us the grace to pass on that love that you have given us. Give us the wisdom to see where that love needs to be given, and give us the boldness and courage to give it. In the name of Christ, we give you thanks and praise. Amen. If you would please stand and we'll continue with our song of the day, Amazing Love.
now together we will confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe, I believe in, in God, God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for the church, those in need, and all of God's creation. O oh God, we pray for the church, that knowing your mercy in Christ Jesus, we might show forth your great love. We pray especially today for Pastor Jody Rice and Grace Lutheran Church in Fremont. We pray for the earth and all its creatures, for wilderness and farmland, cities and towns, for oceans, lakes, and streams. Give us wisdom to live well upon this beautiful earth. We pray for our whole human family, created in your image, and yet divided by race and class, gender and creed. Gather us around your table of mercy. Forgive us our sins and heal our divisions. We pray for all who are bowed down, for those neglected or abused, frightened or despairing. We pray for all who cry out for healing and hope, especially those whose names are listed in the bulletin today along with those that we name aloud or silently at this time. We ask for your blessings upon Lisa and Les Tackett upon their wedding yesterday. We pray for those in care facilities, those bound at home and all caregivers. We ask for your blessings upon the military. We pray for all who love and nurture children, especially fathers and grandfathers, godfathers and uncles. Bless them in their vocation to raise up our children in love. We give you thanks, Almighty Father, for all you have for all who have gone before us and for those that now find their rest in you, especially those fathers who we remember today. Hold us in your mercy until we are reunited in your great love. Into your hands, O God of compassion, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your great mercy through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated.
No better word than from your lips. No perfect life than what you lived. No greater gift, no, not one. No brighter star has ever shined. No better hope for all mankind. No higher mind, no, not one. And no one has ever known this kind of love you've shown. There has never been a greater love than your son, no, not one. And there will never be a greater love, no, not one. With his life you have forgiven us. Hope has come, hope has come. And there will never be a greater love, no, not one. No image true or sweeter frame. No simple word can match your name. No greater fame, no, not one. No one has ever seen the depth of your majesty. There has never been a greater love than your son. No, not one, and there will never be a greater love. No, not one. With his life you have forgiven us. Hope has come, hope has come, and there will never be a greater love. No, not one. No greater call. You gave us all a reason to live, no greater love. You gave us all a reason to give, no greater life. You gave us all a reason to shine, no greater love forever mine. your son, no, not one, and there will never be a greater love, no, not one. With his life you have forgiven us, hope has come, hope has come, and there will never be a greater love, no, not one. If you would please stand. Now let us pray together the prayer that our Lord has taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, then forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. As we open the portals of this sanctuary to return to our roles in the world, may we likewise throw open the locked doors of our hearts. Go forth from this place, empowered by the Holy Spirit, to love and to serve a world hungry for that love and service. Amen. One, two, ready, ready. See you. 
Go in peace. Proclaim the good news. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. We at Emmanuel Lutheran Church in Marion want to thank you for joining our worship service today. We hope today's service was both uplifting and has enriched your spiritual life. And we would certainly welcome and encourage you to visit one of our services in person. Our services are Sundays 8 and 10.30 for the traditional worship and 9.15 for the contemporary worship service. Thursday evenings at 7.30 we have our praise service. And the fourth Sunday of each month at 1.30 our gentle worship service. We also want to thank you for your continued support of our television ministry. Won't you help us continue spreading the gospel of Christ by sending your donations to Emmanuel Lutheran Television at 241 South Prospect Street in Marion. No gift is too small and will help us continue our goal of spreading the word of Christ. So until our next broadcast, God be with you till we meet again.